Thank you very much, and um, thanks to Brian and the other organizers for inviting me to contribute to this panel. Am I loud enough at the back? Yeah, okay. Um, and thanks to everyone who's presented so far. I've never been to a uh, PKP conference before, and it's really interesting to get a sense of how the community works from the inside. Okay. I feel more than a little schizophrenic presenting on uh, uh, views from researchers, um, but I, I suppose um, it's not much different uh, from Juan Pablo. I'm uh, kind of a hybrid beast at this point, I think, part researcher and part something else a lot closer to that other position, I'm not sure what to call it, represented by most of the folks in this room from which researchers are being distinguished. So I'm a humanities scholar by training. I did my dissertation on Victorian poetry and social change. I'm not a journal editor. I guess I'm kind of a journal publisher because of um, my connection to the Canadian Society for Digital Humanities, which runs um, a journal using the, uh, it's an open access peer reviewed digital only journal, uh, digital studies, Le Champ Numérique, uh, using PKP. And it's right now in the midst of migration to the Open Library of the Humanities. But I feel like a, a fellow traveler on the OA train, uh, not least because because I bump into um, uh, people from projects like PK, PKP all the time, um, in my work as a digital humanities scholar. I work on collaborative uh, digital scholarship, particularly born digital scholarship, and in that capacity I lead an infrastructure project called the Canadian Writing Research Collaboratory. Um, and you can't promote collaborative online scholarship without promoting open access, obviously. So Quirk is a, a virtual research environment. I'm not going to talk about it for very long. Um, that was the home page. This is really the, the core of it, which is the, the dashboard page where people can actually do stuff. Um, but it is a publishing platform as well, meant to um, uh, incorporate new form digital scholarship in a range of forms and um, also to uh, give projects their own home pages. So that's what you see on the right, on the, it's overlapped, um, a sort of overview page of the, the, some of the projects that we have hosted within Quirk. Um, so much of what I have to say here then emerges not from my own perspective as a, a researcher, um, which like the vast majority of people in the digital humanities is firmly committed to open access and open source, but from interactions with researchers in connection with Quirk. So please believe me when I say that I totally get the value propositions of open access. I truly do. And please believe me when I say that I think most of my colleagues in the humanities do not. I don't think that open access has really registered with them, or when it has, they're more likely to have misunderstood it and consider it irrelevant or a threat. Um, so I'm sure that a lot of what I'm going to say uh, is, is familiar in some ways to many of you. And I do recognize that the kind of systematic research um, that we just heard about is a, is a complement to what I'm talking about. I guess what I'm, what I'm talking about is the sense that I've got from the ground as somebody who's trying to promote open digital scholarship. Um, one of the most basic uh, misunderstandings that circulated a lot in response to the Tri-Council statements on open access in the, in the sort of more humanities um, scholarly circles that, that I travel in was the idea that it would take away the freedom to publish in the venue of their choice. You know, it's not true, but that was what people were saying, and they were saying it loudly, and they were saying it to um, anyone who would listen in, in, in a lot of public fora. And if that response seems ridiculous, uh, it is worth reflecting on the ways in which the autonomy of faculty members has been eroded in so many ways by the bureaucratization and corporatization of the university. I think it makes sense. So what's needed are stories about the benefits of open access that can counter the negative ones, um, that despite the undeniable value of open access um, are, are needed in order to give humanities scholars at least an awareness of the importance that hasn't taken hold in the way that it ought to so far. So I say this based in part on response um, to the uh, experience of launching a hybrid open access publication that was produced by the Canadian Writing Research Collaboratory in collaboration with the University of Alberta Press and with support from the University of Alberta Libraries. Thank you, Leah. Um, this was an experiment in using an innovative e-reading interface, um, part of the Voyant Tool Suite produced by Stéphane Sinclair at McGill with 
lovely production values because we were building on a, a press produced um, publication and we had a, a, a wonderful scholarly index and it was in fact the, the project was in, in part an inquiry into the relationship between traditional indexing practices associated with print and the kind of XML markup that we do in the digital humanities, which is very indexical as well. Um, so I thought at this launch, we had you know, really good turnout from people in the Canadian uh, literary studies community that we would be engaged in this really interesting conversation about the affordances of new forms of digital scholarship and what people's work could do. The main response to the launch, I would say, was actually puzzlement, sort of questions like, you mean this is free? I can access it on the web. There's no password. I could share it with my students and use this in my teaching. There was clearly no context of a larger understanding of open access among the dozens of scholars at that event. So why? I've been thinking about this a lot. Um, and like I say, I think that a lot of what I'm going to say won't really be news in some ways to people, but I think it's worth reflecting on because I do think there's a, a big hump to be gotten over here. So a lot of what gets stressed in um, Spark and, and other contexts where open access is sort of the focus of, of discussion is the economic argument about the profit margins of uh, journals, about um, publicly funded research and the need to, to liberate it from the, um, the, the predatory um, for profit um, commercial interests. Um, the profit margins at most humanities journals and the cost of the journals, at least in the sort of literary uh, communities that I circulate in, um, are not nearly as outrageous as those in the sciences. In fact, the journal publishing mode that most of us in the humanities are likely to have seen is the journal being published in, on our campus with support from uh, Shirk and um, operating on a shoestring. It doesn't look like there's anything to be uh, sort of reduced in terms of profit scooping there. Um, we don't see the rapacious multinational profiting model um, in our disciplines uh, nearly as much, I think, as, as some others. Um, and the perennial shrinkages in, in library budgets have been um, having, or have been felt in the humanities for decades now. So the sort of impact of the, the scaling back in budgets, again, doesn't seem like a, a big change. The big ticket items in our field tend to be the digitized, digitized source collections rather than the journals. And uh, that's, I think, the absence of those, or the disappearance of those from collections is, is more likely to be noted than, than journals themselves. Another of the major value propositions um, is about uh, citation counts or, or impact factors. Um, it'll be interesting to see the results of the, the study. Um, but in, again, the circles that I travel in, that's not the currency, right? The currency is whether you're publishing in the right journal for your topic, and that may be a tiny journal with, that just doesn't rate in terms of those uh, more standardized uh, metrics. What does, does register, though, is um, impact of a different kind if it can if it can be driven home so i remember talking to colleagues about um the, the, how they would think about allocating their time to new form um, digital publications and they had been approached by a website that um, they were thinking they would not contribute to. It wasn't um, a standard sort of peer review. It wasn't recognizable as a journal or, or something that would um, you know, be, be recognized in uh, a faculty evaluation context until they were told that this site regularly got 100,000 visitors, unique visitors per month. And then it was like, oh, well, yes, I would like to get my research out there in that way to those people who might not otherwise read it. Um, so the sense that they could circulate their work at an entirely different level registered in a way that something like impact factors would not. Um, I think, too, that we can't underestimate the, the power that um, not just peer review, but um, imprint and cache have in the humanities. Uh, although progress has been made, it's still true as the JISC uh, 2014 study on attitudes to open access um, found that most people think about monographs as physical objects. And they don't think about something as having really been published unless there's something to hold. And that's why I would say there's been much more progress made in the area of open access journal publication than in other areas because a printed PDF of an article, if the production values are high, looks like an off print. And that's what people were sort of, you know, sort of cut their teeth on. 
I think that the open courseware movement will help, um, and it's, it's just um, in many ways gearing up, and I think awareness in the humanities, again, we don't tend to have um, the, necessarily the super high textbook costs in our field, and many of us have been teaching with um, you know, uh, course packs for, for years now, but I do think that if people understand that um, if, they're become, if, they're, if what emerges from the open courseware movement is really user-friendly means of gathering open access content together, and that would be primary as well as secondary content to create course packages, uh, I think that would go a long way towards convincing people that um, uh, OA matters. I do think that the argument for the public good and the research commons um, does have a lot of traction in the humanities research community, but I do not think that it tends to um, change practices. I think people agree with it and they say, yeah, 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 that, that's really interesting, that makes sense. Um, but I don't think it's going to actually change what people do um, until they have new affordances for research activities that they didn't have before. In other words, they're gonna have to gain something from the shift. Um, so I think we think a lot, and those of us who work with data know how fragile it is and how much it, we, we need um, preservation um, workflows, but I think we have to remember that to, to leverage the capacity of open network scholarship um, to help researchers do what they have to do differently now in the ways that will make a difference to their current work is equally important because otherwise they're not gonna change how they're doing things. Um, so we have to think about scholars of the future, but we also have to think about scholars now. And we not only have to demonstrate the potential, we have to make it easy, as Mike Nason stressed yesterday, to do the right thing and to change that workflow. Um, I think he said in the question and answers, um, something like faculty get it, but they don't have the time to care. They don't have the time to do things differently until they can really see um, where the benefit would be. They're not technophobes, they're not lazy, they're really, really pressed for time. And so to change the way that they do things, they have to see um, an, a, a real benefit. Um, otherwise, they're just gonna stick to what they've been doing. So, in other words, I'm talking about you know, meeting researchers where they're working and in ways that make sense to them. I mean, this is a really small, obvious example, but I think it's a really telling one. Why on earth would anybody have to type the bibliographic information for the first publication of Pride and Prejudice ever again, right? <laughs> How many times does that get typed every single year, right? That information is there, it's verified, but it's not mobile, it's not accessible, it's not integrated into scholarly workflows. So um, I think there's so many ways in which our information environments could be better engineered to serve researchers. PKP has gone a long way towards that for journal editing. I presume ROD, I know it less well, so I can't really say has, has two. Um, although Mike's uh, presentation yesterday suggested that there are some, some real pain points, especially when inexperienced uh, researchers are, are um, engaging with the platform. Um, but what I'm talking about doing is, um, really moving beyond the frame of ERUD or PKP or journal publishing generally um, to link up the scholarship that's freed by open access as a crucial component of a much larger set of complementary resources, tools, and services that um, John Simpson and I have argued elsewhere should be understood as a digital ecosystem. We use the language of ecosystems a lot, but we really do have the opportunity um, to, to take the data that we have and really have it interacting in uh, much more dynamic ways than uh, is currently the case because we have these um, sort of silos. They're huge silos, but they are still silos. Um, for what we have to remember is that journals are themselves a scholarly genre that are a legacy of print culture. And we have already heard today, you know, discussions of ways in which people are starting to push on that model because they understand how much more can be done in the digital context than put uh, text in a sequential um, arrangement. So the best way of doing that effectively, in my view, is through linked open data, uh, for which we need uh, a better infrastructure, but that's another conversation. So let me just end by saying that I think that PKP has really led the way in demonstrating the kind of transformative intervention that can emerge from university-driven innovation and infrastructure, and the ways that this kind of innovation can unlock knowledge. Thanks to the work of all of you in this room and many others, including Jean-Claude Guédon, and the open access movement has come a very long way, and that is amazing. And there's still a long way to go. As John Walensky said yesterday, we're maybe roughly halfway there, but we're by no means halfway there if you focus on monographs, that bastion of humanities knowledge production. 
So it's great that the PKD RUD Cyber Infrastructure Partnership is pushing towards data mobilization of the type that will contribute to an understanding of what a game changer open access will be. Because in my view, only by insinuating the benefits of open access into daily research lives and making a difference there in ways that are legible to the humanities will this major paradigm shift in how people think about disseminating their work really take hold. Thank you.